Um, so, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Dimmick. I'm the uh, Director of Collections and Curatorial here at the Detroit Historical Society. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for coming, of course, before uh, we get started here and making your way out uh, on a uh, kind of a blustery, wet December day. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest for this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Murray Howe is the author of the national bestseller, Nine Lessons I Learned From My Father, that we're going to be talking about today. He was awarded the University of Michigan's prized Avery Hopwood Award for Journalism and is the head of sports medicine imaging for Toledo Radiological Associates and ProMedica Health's Health Systems Sports Care Program. He is an associate clinical professor at the University of Toledo Medical Center and has four decades of experience as a keynote speaker across the United States and Canada, covering various topics including sports medicine, health and wellness, and of course hockey. He lives in Ohio and also happens to be the youngest son of hockey legend Gordy Howe. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Murray Howe. Thank you very much. Oh, that's awesome. yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the format of the talk here will be a bit of, uh, a, bit of a conversation with, uh, I don't know, 100 people or so listening in on it. Um, but uh, yeah, we, I think we can assume uh, most people in the audience have read the book, but uh, I'll ask a couple questions and then I guess if you wouldn't mind explaining the story uh, that I'm referencing for, for the people who may not have had a chance to read it yet, um, then we'll go from there. Uh, and of course, if anyone... Um, uh, didn't purchase a book to be signed uh, beforehand, uh, you're welcome to do so. They're for sale up in our gift shop, and uh, Dr. Howe's nice enough to hang around after the tour, to after the tour, <laughs> after the talk here, um, to sign some more books as well. So uh, you're welcome to stay afterwards. Um, but yeah, I uh, first of all, I, I love this book. <laughs> <laughs> I Me <thought> too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I went into it, I, uh, I'll admit, I went into it expecting uh, one thing and came out completely satisfied with something else. Um, but it's a, it's, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a, a lovely tribute to Mr. Hockey, Gordy Howe, and um, a lot of the stories that we're going to be talking about through the program, I think, really get at the heart of who he was as a person. And of course, uh, no one better than, than Murray to tell us about that. So um, the one thing I was really struck by, the first uh, question I'll ask you too is, the one thing I was really struck by was when you read this book, you just see uh, Gordy Howe as someone with an extraordinary amount of confidence. Um, you know, there's stories about him uh, just showing up at local rinks or going into signings and talking to every person who wants to talk to him, taking pictures with every person who wants to take pictures with him. Um, it's just, uh, uh, looking at it, you can't help but think like, wow, where did all that confidence come from? Sure. And of course, you know, a lot of it comes from being Gordy Howe. <laughs> but uh, there's a fair amount that happens in his younger life too, before he is playing professional hockey. Um, and uh, there's two stories that jump out. You know, the one you mentioned about uh, him sleeping in Olympia Stadium underneath the bleachers, and uh, also the, the story about the school bully, him taking on the, the bully. Um, I wonder if you could talk, tell those stories, I suppose, and then talk a little bit about where you think that confidence came from. I would love to. <laughs> I'm going to digress briefly, though. Sure. Um, I want to carry on a tradition that my dad always did. Whenever he uh, did an appearance, he always started out by, number one, thanking everybody for being here. I know there's lots of stuff you could be doing on this rainy day other than being here, but I really appreciate you being here. It's very, very special to me to be able to share my dad with all of you. And the other thing that my dad would do is he would always acknowledge his family that were there at the, at the time, and I remember it vividly because I was six years old, and he would say, and of course, my youngest, Murray, you know, he's in first grade at Annie Lathrop Elementary, and uh, he plays hockey too, and he loves to play army men, or whatever, whatever was going on that was of no import to anybody, but I was special to him, and that made me feel like I was 100 feet tall. So today I just want to, to uh, let everybody know that we have my, my wife Colleen here, uh, and then we have uh, a few of my kids, uh, my son uh, Gordy and his wife Margaret. 
Uh, and uh, their new son, Shiloh, who's three months old. So Shiloh's here. So if you hear some crying in the back, it's not Colleen or Gordy. It's Shiloh. Uh, uh, Margaret's parents are also here. Jim and Linda, uh, Jim recently had knee surgery, so he uh, dug in deep to be able to be here today, so we're glad for that. And then also my daughter, Megan, uh, uh, is here with uh, her husband, Doug, and then our grandson, our other, one of our other grandsons, Lucian, and then our granddaughter, Layla. So we have, I, I want if no one else showed up today, we were still gonna have a big crowd. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming. So, um, the question that you asked, Jeremy, is, is it's the first time I've been asked that question, and I think it's a, it's a great question. It's awesome having a couple of puppies in the audience because my dad loved dogs, by the way, absolutely loved them, and he had a little uh, teacup poodle named Rocket that he would carry around towards the end of his life, and Rocket would go everywhere. He met presidents, and he went into every finest restaurant in the world that no dog would ever get into if they weren't recording out. Anyway, so I love I love having the pups here. But anyway, so the first story is 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 the bully story. So he was dad was I believe in in like first grade, maybe third grade, something like that. And there was a big bully in their school who was three years older than him. And he was just beating the the, the bejeebers out of another student. And my dad was on his way home and he, you could never be late if you were supposed to be at my grand, you know, back at, back at dad's home, if you were late, you would, it would just be hellfire uh, from my grandfather. So he wanted to get home, but he also saw this kid getting beat up by this bully. And even though the bully was quite a bit bigger than my dad, my dad just, he learned that you never leave somebody behind. You, if somebody's in, in trouble or needs help, you, you take care of them. So he went and uh, beat the stuffing out of this kid. And, and uh, so after that incident, uh, the, the uh, principal, Mr. Tricky, um, who my dad talked about a lot, even in, in, his, in his last years, Mr. Tricky was a huge influence on him. But Mr. Tricky brought him and the bully into the office for fighting. And uh, dad could hear Mr. Tricky yelling at this kid on the other side of the wall. And he's like, oh, I'm in big trouble. And the, the uh, kid came out and he was just bawling and you know looked like he had, he had been hit, hit a little bit, which was pretty common back in Saskatoon in schools. Um, but anyway, then uh, my dad went in, in the office and the principal just said, don't tell anybody I said this or you're gonna be in big trouble, but he deserved it. <laughs> Good job. So, <laughs> And that was all, that was the only punishment he had was, was that. Um, anyway, so that was one story. And then the other story, when, when my dad, when he, uh, many of the good players in Saskatoon were recruited by the pro teams back then, right? Saskatoon was a hotbed, like Kirkland, Ontario was, for because it was just freezing cold. There was nothing else to do than play hockey, right? So anyway, so 17 players from Saskatoon went down to the Detroit Red Wings for that tryout uh, back in 1946, I believe. And um, uh, the, the, the Wings said, we're sorry, guys, there's not enough room to put up all the players, so some players are gonna have to sleep underneath the bleachers in, in Olympia. And if you've ever been in Olympia and know what's under those bleachers, it's a frightening thing. And my dad's like, I'll do it. I'll do it. And so they set up cots underneath <laughs> underneath there. And of course, all the players really that earned him a lot of respect because, you know, they you know, that would he was the first and and uh, uh, but my dad said, Oh, the only reason I did it is I wanted to be first on the ice in the morning. <laughs> so, uh, he actually there was two tryouts. There was the A A tryout and the B tryout, one was after the other. He stayed out for both tryouts because he said, I want to make sure these guys see me. So he just stayed out there even though he was breaking the rules. And they saw, um, but but why did he? How did he do this when he was a shy, you know, uh, Saskatoon boy? He just learned that you gave it, at, that you were so fortunate for every little gift that you had, and you made the most of it. You you didn't waste those gifts. So he saw this as an opportunity. He knew that this bully. He knew he could take him because all he did was play hockey and beat up guys on the ice, even though he was in first grade, and. Uh, and under the bleachers, 
there was actually probably a more comfortable bed than he was sleeping on because he slept on the floor at his house, you know, or they had crates, pallets that they would actually steal from the local, um, the, the local um, hotels. They would have, you know, pallets that they would move food in and they would take his pallets home and use them as a bed so that they were not on the hard wood floor that was colder because they had no indoor heat. So this cot was probably a lot better than what he was used to. Um, so for him, it wasn't so much confidence, it was just like, I'm gonna make the most of this. And you know, he saw that his opportunity that he could be first on the ice if he slept right next to the ice. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, and you mentioned you know, uh, Olympia, and you had a chance to, there's some stories in the book about you running around Olympia and finding all kinds of stuff. I was just curious when I read that, I was like, wow, to have kind of unfettered access to Olympia Stadium must have been quite a thing too. If any, you know, any uh, stories come to mind about running around Olympia all by yourself. It, it had to be the best, the, the most amazing privilege that anybody could ever imagine is being able to, when you're five years old, to be able to go down to, it would be Little Caesars Arena now, and while your dad is getting dressed in the dressing room for practice, you could be out on the ice all by yourself. It was incredible. I had a, a million pucks I could shoot around. I would pretend I was in the NHL or whatever. And why I remember this all so vividly, not only did I love doing that, but one time I was skating down, I was on the far end of the, of, of the rink, circling behind the net, and I was carrying the puck, imagining that I was you know, making a big play. And all of a sudden, boom, I just fell on my rear end. What happened? And my dad was on the other end of the ring, and he had stepped out, he hadn't, he hadn't dressed yet for the practice, he'd stepped out on the ice, just in his shoes, and he fired a wrist shot so hard and so accurately, he hit my skates from the other end of the ring and knocked me on the rim. Now, nowadays, that would be called child abuse, but I was thrilled. So, but that kind of shows you, that number one, a sense of humor, and, and number two, the skills that he had to be able to hit me on uh, first try. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, wow. <laughs> How much, yeah, how fun, how fun that must have been. Well, and you played with your dad quite a, quite a bit. And, um, you know, when you read the book, it, it sounds like right up until the very end, you know, you tell the story about even in 2016, uh, playing hockey in the basement with your dad. I, I guess, you know, there's no real question there, just kind of uh, astonishment about, um, you know, I guess it's something he did his entire life. So why wouldn't he, he keep playing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and dad, you know, both my parents were really great parents from the standpoint that they never pushed any of us to do something. They just said, you know, we're going to expose you to all these things. Whatever you love to do, then do that thing. We didn't have to be hockey players. We didn't have to be, you know, golfers or whatever it was. Uh, but we all developed an early love for hockey. Even though, I mean, in retrospect, I was not a very good player, despite all the, you know, having the Gordy Howe gloves and Gordy Howe stick and Gordy Howe hockey school training. I was probably the worst player for the amount of time spent trying to be a, a good hockey player. But I had the love for it, right? Because that's that's what my dad gave gave to all of us. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so we we pretty much spent our early life just playing driveway hockey and then going to play regular hockey. And when there was no ice around and we were tired of driving hockey, you know, we'd, we'd kick the football around or the baseball or whatever, but hockey was definitely the first love in our, in our home. And it was so fun to play against this legend. Now, of course, back then I didn't realize he was a legend. I only realized I could not get the puck away from him, ever. I mean, for one thing, he was so huge and he knew how to shield the puck, that was one of his great skills, is no player could get the puck from Gordie Howe, because he you had to get around his body. So for a little kid, we'd have to like sneak between his legs or whatever. <laughs> if you ever got the puck from him for one second, that was like winning the Stanley Cup. It was so huge. And of course, then he would take it back instantly. Because he was, even with his own kids, he had a lot of pride. He wanted to, he still wanted to win. But what it, when he would play with us, he would always, carry the puck around, and then he would set somebody else up to score. He never wanted to score and say, oh, I'm Gordie Howe, I'm the you know, champion or whatever. He just loved being able to just kind of uh, keep the flow going. And one of the 
one of my fondest memories of playing hockey with him was when he was in the father-son games when I was a little kid. We were seven years old playing against the dads, right? And most of the dads could not skate at all, you know? And they were so thrilled to just be out on the ice with Mr. Hockey. And, uh, and um, dad always played on our side just to even things up. There was a couple dads that could play really well. So dad was on our side, so he would skate through all these other dads and then set us up. And so we just scored, you know, eight, nine goals or whatever, <laughs> all set up by Gordy Hockey. He never shot the puck in the net himself. So he was, that's the part of his gent gentleman uh, side. Yeah, yeah, and that, uh, that comes up quite a bit in the book, just how magnanimous he was. Um, I mean, literally hanging around after events, signing signing and hanging out with people and taking pictures. I mean, that really comes through and really paints this really beautiful picture, I think, of yeah. who he was and what he was about. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, in the book uh, a couple times about just hockey players. You know, obviously yeah. you, you were around a lot of hockey players, you yeah. yourself and as, as a young man too. But um, you say, there's a quote in here that struck me too, and I'll read it. It says, quote, when I meet hockey players, I never cease to be blown away by their benevolence, end quote. So I wonder, you know, what it is, because you hear that in the media also, that uh, from reporters who have to deal with all kinds of professional athletes and um, hockey players always get the highest marks as far as, you know, just seeming down to earth, generally nice people. Uh, I wonder if you, you know, what you think about that. Is it, is it the game itself? Is it the kind of innate Canadian qualities <laughs> about the game that, that make it that way? Or I'm just interested in your take on that. You know, um, over the years, I've had the opportunity to go to Saskatoon several times. And in fact, um, one of our sons, Corey, he actually met a nurse from Saskatoon at an event for my dad back in 2015. They fell in love. And so he ended up uh, moving to Saskatoon. So we've been to Saskatoon a lot now because of Corey and uh, his wife, Davis. And now they've got, got uh, three, three kids, one on the way. And uh, so we had the opportunity to get to know the town and know the people. And I came to the conclusion that everybody in Saskatoon is like my dad. Like they're just, it's this it, it incredible uh, courteousness and, and, and kindness. And I think a lot of it stems from, it's so brutal up there. It's the coldest place on earth many days of the year. You have to help your neighbor. You have to be kind. And and and, uh, and help each other because you'd literally die if your if your if your car breaks down, you know. Before cell phones were invented, you just died in the in the minus fifty weather. So if you saw a car on the side of the road, you stopped and you helped them. And uh, so that kind of that kind of um, neighborliness, um, you you saw it my dad all the time. I mean, literally when we were at home, he would be doing whatever to the neighbors, you know, sweeping their driveway, shoveling their driveway, uh, cutting down a tree if it looked like it needed to be, you know, cut down, whatever it was, he just, he just, he loved helping people. And uh, so many hockey players are from Canada, so I think that's kind of, has start the ball rolling, and now new players that are from Russia, wherever they're from, they see this in the dressing room, they see this model, that you that you um, you're courteous to the fans and you're respectful and politeful. Um, it was actually uh, or polite. Um, it was actually um, a, a great privilege, I think, for all the players who played with my dad um, in his pro years because they were all better people because of him. Especially the young players that were married and maybe you know all these women are throwing themselves at these players or whatever. And Mr. Hockey would be like. Don't go down that road or whatever. So anyway, they maybe were a little mad at him, but also at the same time, I think in the end, they, they, they uh, got to thank him because he kept them all on the right road, and he made sure that if they were going out the door, they were signing signatures for every fan that wanted it, and he just set a tone, and that, that seems to have continued all the way all the way till now. Yeah, yeah that's really interesting, and yeah, it's, it's a great point, too, the, the story in the book about uh, Terry Sawchuk, you know, comes well, to mind. Um, but no, it's when when the best player on your team and the best player in the league does that, it's a, it's an easier example to follow, I suppose, than yes. you know the last guy on the bench is doing it. Um, but it says a lot about that player. Um, so you mentioned too him uh, keeping busy around the house, uh, you know, doing chores, uh, shoveling the driveway. 
And it, it made me think of um, this part where uh, you talk about the award he won for uh, being the world's most perfectly built man, but really not, um, you know, didn't have a didn't have a weight set in the house, or you know, which um, you think about today and everything athletes do to get their bodies and I guess their minds too ready for a long professional season. Mm -hmm. um, it made me think too. His career was, uh, I mean, the longevity obviously is there from 1946 to 1980. Yeah. Um, I wonder if he stayed that way, the way he was, you know, if his his pads, his preparation, his diet, all that sort of thing. Or if that changed from you know early on to when he stopped playing. Yeah, so he was truly a, a physical phenomenon and I was so fortunate to be in a spot where I had a medical background and was able to number one study him physically and and notice how he was different than the average person. But also as he would have any medical problems, you know, I got a chance to, you know, x-ray his wrists and you know, shoulders and, and, and know him more intimately than anybody should probably know their, their dad. Um, but also to be able to, to, to really know and understand, um, you know, uh, the physical sacrifices of, of any professional athlete, but especially one who plays for 32 professional seasons, just the, the, wear, and tear, the wear and tear in the body. Um, but dad, there was a number of reasons I think that he was so successful at what he did. Number one, he was born with just an incredible, unusual physique. When he was uh, 14, he was already uh, six feet tall and 210 pounds. So, and I met several several players who um, were in Saskatoon and played against him as kids. They said, we were so afraid to be on the ice against your dad because he was just frightening. He was a mountain and he was angry. He wanted that puck. He didn't even want to touch it if he was on the ice because he would just crush you to get that puck. So that was number one. He was, he was gifted. But more importantly, because there's so many gifted athletes in the world or people with gifts and different things, maybe not even athletes, that don't necessarily use their talents. He took those talents and he never took them for granted. He did everything possible to make sure that he got bigger, better, stronger. So he always was disciplined in what he ate. You know, he, he made, he just didn't eat garbage. You know, he didn't, I, did, I never remember him eating candy or anything during the time that he was playing. He just didn't do that. Chocolate ice cream after he retired, for sure. <laughs> um, but he was very disciplined that way. And then he always stayed active. When you, we didn't have, there was no weight training or anything like that back then. So what he would do is just, he would shovel like dirt in a, you know, anybody, if anybody had a dirt hole or, or a dirt mound that they needed shoveled, he would just be so excited or a house would be torn down or any physical activity, just carrying rocks, boulders, whatever. He couldn't wait to do that stuff and he would do it nonstop. If there was nothing like that around, he would clean the house. He, he did all the house cleaning. My mom just, she loved to cook. He, he couldn't cook anything other than he could grill, and that was it. So anyway, he loved to just be, be active that way, and uh, that never stopped. Um, throughout his, at the end of his career, when he was in his 50s, um, and things were changing in terms of training regimens, some of the coaches tried to have him try this new stuff, try some weightlifting or running, which he, he said, I will only run if there's food at the end of the training <laughs> floor, or whatever. He did not like to run. Um, but he, he would do anything, he would skate, he would skate as far as he wanted. And his idea was right, which is, if you wanna be good at something, do that thing. Don't try to do alternate things to make you get in shape for that thing, do that thing. So he would skate all year long, you know, wherever he could find an ice patch he would be in. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, and um, you know, it made me think too, you talk about him doing everything he possibly could to leverage his talent. It obviously ends up in pretty rare company as far as you know, records and games played and, and all of that. But um, uh, Wayne Gretzky comes up a couple different times in the book, and obviously they had uh, a friendship. And uh, you know, um, I wonder if you could talk uh, a little bit about why you why you think that is. I uh, I have a thought, but I'm interested to know what you think too. Yeah, so so I got to know Wayne really well. I had the privilege of playing with him for one year up in Toronto during juniors when I was uh, 15 and, 
or I'm sorry, I was 16, he was 15. And um, so this was just before he exploded as a, you know, as a, as a player. Um, but Wayne was a, was a phenomenon. He scored 378 goals in one season, where, you know, the most anybody else would score, maybe 50, 40 goals, that was a good season. 378 goals, I don't know how a human being does that. And that's when he was 10 years old. So he was the Canadian uh, athlete, uh, amateur athlete of the year as a 10 year old. So my dad went to this event. He was supposed to be the keynote speaker. So he met Wayne then. And Wayne was so excited to meet, you know, Mr. Hockey. He had been his idol since, you know, since Wayne could, could remember. Like many players, perhaps most players in Canada, back then, Gordie Howe was just who you wanted to be. Unless you lived in Quebec, then of course it was Rocket Richard. It was fine, it was wrong, venerable. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but for most players, that was, Gordie Howe was their idol, and Wayne loved, what, what I think sets Wayne and my dad apart is they loved hockey more than anybody that I know. And so, you know, when other players would go home or eat or whatever, they'd still be on the ice trying out new moves or, or, or whatever. They just were, they were students of the game. And they, they played for fun. Winning was great, but they played because they wanted to be on that ice. Um, so when I, when I played with Wayne, um, I was in awe of him, right? Because he is, you know, he's already called the Wonder Kid, the great one back then. And he was way better than any of us on the ice, even though he was a year younger than me and uh, many years younger than the rest of the crew. Um, he was just incredible. But he was in awe of me because I was Gordie Howe's son, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we got along really well because when we'd go on bus trips, it would, for three hours, he would just be like, what's your dad's favorite food? What's he eat for breakfast? And what's his favorite sport other than hockey? And you know, what's his regimen? You know, before the game and everything. He just couldn't get enough of, uh, of Gordie Howe. So we developed a great friendship and, and I'm very glad, my whole family's very glad that Wayne was the one that, that broke, you know, most of my dad's scoring records because Wayne, he, he never took it for granted. He never said, oh, see, now I'm the best. He has always said, Gordie's the best. I just happen to be fortunate to play in a time where I can you score all these goals. and. And, uh, and, th and that's wonderful, you know, it's a great, great attitude. Yeah, and being, being around as many NHL players and professional players and Hall of Fame players that, that you were around, um, yeah, that, you, you think that's it, that, um, you know, it goes back to that story of him yeah. wanting to be closest to the ice so he could be yeah. the first down in the morning. You think that's, yeah. that's kind of what set those guys apart from even Hall of Fame professional yeah. players. Yeah. yeah, Dan has always said it's about the love, and not just in hockey, but whatever you do, if you love something, you're going to be good at it. And the more you, you know, when you love something, you want to keep on doing it. And so, you know, I always, I, I coached hockey and soccer for you know, many, many years, and with all of my players, especially with our own kids, you know, we just always said just, you know, we want this to be fun. We want you to try to learn all the skills you can, make this game the most that you can, but, you know, this is not about winning. This is about having a blast out there and, and making some memories. Because very few of you are going to make it to pros, but you're going to be able to carry these memories and these friendships for your whole life. So let's make this something special. So um, whatever it is that your kids do or your grandkids that they love, they, I would just encourage those passions as, and, and let them take them as, as far as possible. For my parents, you know, they just said, wow, he loves to, he loves to read and write. So do that as much as you want. And it was nice that I had a fallback, you know, after I didn't make the pros. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that was something that, that jumps out too, I think, in the book is kind of the, the family culture, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, you hear about that in the workplace of like, well, if you don't have a workplace culture, you have one and it's bad and you just don't know it yet. But it's like you have to be dedicated about how you set up your family culture. Um, and yeah, obviously that, you know, I don't know if, um, do you have any insight into whether that was a conversation or if that came from your dad or your mom or it was kind of a joint effort to, to uh, do that and then live it on a daily basis? Too? Yeah, um, our son Gordy that's here, he's actually a, a therapist and something that he taught me that I never knew, he said, Dad, the most important things as a parent is to make sure that your kids feel loved and that they feel safe. And 
that's something that my parents did so well. We had no doubt that our parents loved us, no matter what, no matter how bad I was at hockey, it didn't matter. They were gonna love me just the same. <laughs> and I knew I was safe, you know, if it, they always had my back, no matter what. And if I had an issue or whatever, they every night they would tuck us in and they'd say, you know, what's going on, how's it going, blah, 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 anything we can do for you, whatever. And if there was a bully at school, you know, we'd talk about it, how to handle that. Whatever, so I always felt safe and I always felt loved. And I think if you do that for your kids, they're all they're gonna be fine because they they can then grow and become what they want without worrying that they're disappointing you or, or, or whatever. So yeah. that's the key. Yeah, that's yeah. again fascinating. It um, I I wanted to ask you too, you you mentioned um, you know, Wayne asking you questions about uh, some of the things I had questions about. What what was your dad's pregame regimen? What you know, what sports did he like outside of baseball? There's a line in the book about uh, him hitting a ball out of Tiger Stadium, more balls, plural, out of Tiger Stadium. I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so Dan, even though hockey was his first love, he he loved every sport. He was a, a, a uh, intense competitor. And that's something you would see if you ever saw him play hockey. If somebody took the puck from him, he would get it back. If you didn't have to chase them all the way down the ice. He wanted to win. And that was something that I saw in Gretzky too. If you're gonna be a champion, you've gotta to want to win. I liked winning, but if I lost, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't the end of the world kind of thing, and that was probably a part of my downfall. So you've got, every champion, they've gotta to, got to wanna to win. So, you know, that's, I think, you know, I think that's a, that's a, a, a big part of that, you know, secret, really. That's, that's really interesting. So I want to uh, change gears, I guess, a little bit here. Um, your your dad's uh, stroke is a big part of the book. Um, and uh, you mentioned that the treatment he underwent, which was really game-changing for yeah. him, um, yeah. you know, was still fairly new at the time of 2014, yeah. I believe. Um, and, you know, now being a few, a few more years uh, removed from even when the book was written, I wonder where that treatment uh, stands today if it's advanced to the point where it's used more or if it's still in kind of experimental stages. Yeah, so yeah, I I wish that stem cell treatment was more advanced than, than it was. As a, as a medical person, I recognize that for any treatment to be uh, effective, you have to do all the clinical trials to show in a large population that it, it helps by this much or whatever um, so that we know that it's not just a fluke with one person or what we call anecdotal stories. It's got to be, it's got to be shown in clinical trials that, you know, time and time again, it shows this much benefit, and then we know we can use it with everybody. Um, with my dad, pretty much, he, he was starting to get some dementia symptoms back in the back around 2014 or so. So we, at that time, we were having him live with each of the kids um, for a couple months at a time each, and. And uh, you know, he's just steadily going downhill, but he could still go out in public and you know, it was not a problem, but vocabulary was very limited uh, at that time. And then he had a massive stroke in, 20, in 2015. And um, so at that point, we're just kind of like, okay, well, this is the end of the line. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk. And I was like, okay, we're gonna say our goodbyes. It'll be a couple weeks and that'll be it. And then we get a, I get a call when we come back to Toledo Hospital from visiting in Lubbock saying there's someone that from the stem cell company that wants to talk to you. I'm like, you know, what is this all about? So I talked to them and the, the, the vice president there was a, was a, a Detroit hockey guy um, who had then gone over there. He said, we're all huge fans of your dad. We love your dad. We have some stem cells that we think, we've seen some great you know, um, uh, 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 examples of people getting better. We think we can help your dad. I said, are you kidding? He's got one foot in the grave. There's no way. He says, if you can get him to San Diego, we will blow your mind. That's what he said. And I'm like, okay, so how much is this gonna cost? You know, because we, were, we didn't want to torture my dad. We didn't want to prolong his agony, you know, but I was open to at least listening. He said, it's free. He said, if you get him here, we will blow your mind. So we're like, okay, so my, I uh, uh, hired my brother, Marty, uh, my big strong brother, Marty, and we carried this 200, 20 pound man, like he literally couldn't walk. We had to you know, carry him and do all the shifting onto you know, wheelchair and this and that to get him on a plane and uh, go down a, you know, an aisle in one of those chair, you know, chair plane things. 
and uh, um, and get him into a seat, and then fly all the way out there and change planes. It was just it was a it was like a nightmare. But for my dad, I would do anything. So we got to San Diego. Um, this is an American company that has a clinic in 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 uh, Tijuana where they can do these kinds of treatments. So anyway, um, they brought him in a limousine across the border, did the treatment, and I was there with him the whole time. And in, in eight hours, he was back up on his feet and he's talking to me. And he's like, I have to use the bathroom. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm calling Marty and saying, you gotta see this. And he's like, I can walk, I don't need your help. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm just, you know, holding him under his, my, his shoulder. And next morning, he's doing even better. And uh, he, he had a second treatment. And then we got him back to San Diego in a hotel. He's walking around, and he had he had walked for six weeks at that point. And um, he's walking around the hotel room, cleaning the cleaning the uh, bathroom, you know, uh, uh, sink, and making the beds. I'm like, Dad, you know, the people will do that or whatever. And he's like, I'm just helping him. But he was so tired because his legs he hadn't walked for six weeks, so he would stand up for 20 seconds, and then he'd sit down and he'd stand up again. And he got progressively better, basically over the, the next year and a half. And that would come in, and I had him for a year and a half um, at at that last, you know, uh, segment of his life. And so we got, to, you know, take him out around where we live in Slovenia, and he would go to the hockey rink and sign autographs, and and um, you know, take pictures with the fans. It was just an incredible experience. And and and. He was able to be at Megan and Doug's wedding, which was a very special thing. We're, we're so grateful for all the moments in that year and a half that we had with him. But uh, one of the most special moments was the trip to Saskatoon. They had a big uh, uh, event for him to honor him. We had told him a long time ago in 2014 that he wasn't going to make it. So when we called him and said, yeah, we know he had a stroke, but you're not going to believe this. He's going to make the event now. And they're like, what? So anyway, he was able to be there on stage with Bobby Hall, Brett Hall, uh, Gretzky, a bunch of other players, and Mark and Marty and myself. And he was able, and he was surrounded by hometown people in Saskatoon. There was not a dry eye in that place. Um, it was just the most amazing experience that he was able to just take in all this love and, 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 and feel that. And so it, it, was just a, it was just an incredible experience. And at that event was when, when our son Corey met the, the nurse Davis. So anyway, it was a two for one on that night. So, um, but anyway, for, for dad, it was just, an, it, was, it, was, it was an incredible transformation. Um, and um, so anyway, what I would say with stem cell treatment, it's got to be, I wouldn't just send anybody out to just get a stem cell treatment or whatever, because they're expensive. The trials need to be done to show that this is a, a you know a, a, a consistently effective thing, and and what I hope someday is that we can get stem cells right in the ER if you have your stroke or whatever or your heart attack. You walk in the door, you get the stem cells, and they go, okay, you don't even you're fine now or whatever, and then you can walk home. That's what I'm hoping for, but it'll several years down the line before we're there. So it's still kind of in that nebulous spot. Yeah, still, yeah, still, still, you know, the clinical trials are being done right now, and hopefully, hopefully they'll get done shortly so we can get get it out there and help people. Right. Yeah. Um, that uh, I, I guess is not not quite a bookend because I don't think we're we're there yet. But um, my next question was about um, this this passage. Uh, it's on page one eight, but um, about. Uh, you, you tell a story about your dad sitting at the table, and I guess it's like converse to a confidence question that we started with, um, where he, he asked you to come sit in his lap, and, and you had a conversation. I wonder if you could take it from there. Yeah, I remember this, this uh, moment vividly because I was 10 years old, maybe 11, and this was just shortly after dad retired, and um, Dad was very rarely serious, and he looks at me with a serious look. He says, Murray, come, come here and sit in my lap. And I'm like, why, why, what, what did I do wrong? Not that he ever reprimanded me for anything, because um, he just wasn't that way. He would just knock you over or something if he did something wrong. But anyway, he just looked me in the eye and he said, Murray, am I a failure? And I was just shocked because he, it, 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 I almost laughed because I'm like, you know, you're like the greatest hockey player of all time. You've achieved all these things, and everybody that you meet, you make their 
life. You make their day, you know, what a gift you have. And I can't think of anybody who has had a greater impact on anybody else. If you measure greatness by that, Dad, you, you know, you've been so successful. So that's kind of what I said to him. And I, I think what it was at the time, he had retired and um, the Revens hired him to the front office and Dad loves to stay busy, but they wouldn't give him anything to do. They didn't want him on the ice. They didn't want him, you know, in any strategy sessions. Um, they didn't want him in just general meetings about uh, recruiting players or any, anything like that. Um, they, they would just send him out to kind of represent the revenues on, you know, different banquets and things like that. And then when he was home, he just said he just sat there. He, he said it was the mushroom treatment where they just come in and, and throw uh, some poop on me every once in a while in a dark room or whatever and just keep you there. Um, so anyway, he did not want to be paid money when he didn't feel like he was earning his keep. You know, so he was really unhappy with that and just kind of questioning, you know, what am I supposed to do now? And so I think our conversation maybe in part helped him to see that, you know, his job wasn't to do anything in the front office. His job was to be Mr. Hockey and just continue to inspire people by being who he was and showing everybody that no matter how big you are, you know, the only thing that's important is how much you give to other people. And he was so good at that, that's all he had to do is just continue being himself. Yeah, and uh, actually this this might be a good time to uh, do what I initially wanted to do at the beginning of the program, which was, uh, I was too excited to start talking with you. But um, to uh, maybe do a reading out of the book uh, of something, you know, I asked uh, Maria to find a passage that might encapsulate really what, what the book is about, and I'll let him I would love to. Thank you. Uh, whenever we went out to eat with friends, Dad always grabbed the check, unless a fan or another guest hijacked it first. He usually wasn't content to stop there. Mom and Dad both loved to look around the restaurant for random people or families and pick up their tab anonymously. This brought them sheer joy. They would wait around to see the recipient's faces when the server informed them that their bill had been paid. It was a wonderful lesson for me on the joy in giving. One afternoon, when Dad was visiting Baskin Robbins, where my brother Marty worked, an entire baseball team streamed in. Not only did he sign every uniform, but he also treated the whole dugout to ice cream. Dad left with more than just ice cream that day. He left a priceless impression on every one of those young men. And that's how generosity works. You always come away with more than you give. If it weren't for that kind of generosity, there might never have been a Mr. Hockey. Back in the Depression, when my grandma Katie was a young mother, a neighbor appeared at the Howe doorstep. Her husband was ill and unable to work, and the woman had no money for milk for their infant. No one had much, certainly not the Howes, but this poor soul had even less. Still, she didn't want to beg. She was carrying a burlap bag filled with whatever her family could spare. She was offering it all for sale for whatever grandma could spare. My grandmother scrounged together all the money that she had in the world, which was a buck 50, plus a bag full of food. The woman was eternally grateful, handed over the burlap sack. When Grandma Katie dumped it out, she saw that it was mostly junk, except for a pair of hockey skates. According to family lore, Dad had to fight his sister at night <laughs> for ownership of those skates. But once they were his, the seeds were sown for the greatest career in the history of the game. Dad was six years old. He wore those skates for the next four years straight. Incredible how the good Lord repays kindness exponentially. So uh, I would estimate that there's some questions in the audience uh, also. I think we're, we're happy to uh, take a few of those as, as long as time allows here. Um, and I can either uh, be microphone runner or uh, someone else would like to, that's fine too. But uh, yes sir, right here in the front. Do you have any, any stories about Jack Adams and your dad? Yes, we have many Jack Adams stories. <laughs> that was a love-hate thing. So Jack was really the one that discovered my dad and started signed, signed him his first contract. And uh, um, 
so my dad was, he felt so, he felt so uh, uh, really honored to, you know, to be in the presence of Mr. Adams. Um, but through the years, dad realized that, you know, Jeff wasn't always being forthright. He discovered near the end of his career that, that you know, Jack had always said, you're the highest paid payer, player in the NHL. And then Carl, Carl Brewer said, well, actually, I'm making twice as much as you. And uh, anyway, so that kind of soured, that soured the relationship somewhat. But dad was more than just about money. He was so loyal that he still recognized, you know, he, was, he still felt indebted to, to, to Jack for that. Uh, my, my mom was not so thrilled with Mr. Adams because he pretty much owned the players, right? And he told them, he literally told the players to keep it in their pants on, you know, Friday before the game, you know, or whatever. And he, he basically told, you know, the wives they weren't like allowed around there or there unless like it was the end of the season party or whatever. So he, he really dominated their lives. So my mom was very unhappy with that. But again, it was still this love kind of hate thing. And Jack, he, he just loved my dad. I mean, just to the point where he was probably the only player that was never traded from, you know, a team in that age because many of the teams were owned by several, of, or I should say many teams were owned by one entity. So Detroit and Chicago were both owned by the Norris family. So they could trade players at will just to, you know, scare them into taking whatever salary they, they, they offered them. Uh, but they wouldn't do that to my dad, right? He was, he was un untouchable because of Mr. Adams. Um, but I do remember we went out to dinner um, and we would do this on occasion. We would go out with Jack and his wife and, and our whole family would go out to dinner. We went to the rooster tail. It was supposed to be this really fancy, you know, fancy occasion or whatever. And two things happened. Um, number, number one, um, you know, I saw Mr. Adams. I said, wow, you're really fat. <laughs> and my mom was like, shut up, or whatever. I said, but mom, he is, he is, or whatever. So I remember that specifically because of my mom's reaction to it. But Mr. Adams said, you know, kid, you might be right. Uh, but, but then Mr. Adams was also very cheap. Like he, 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 he loved every dollar that he had. And my mom was talking about how much, my mom and dad were talking about how much ice cream I eat that I just had this huge appetite for a little guy. And he said, well, we'll see about that. He said, how about, I'm gonna order you some ice cream and if you finish it, I'm gonna give you a dollar. And so I said, fair enough, you know, I need a full meal, but I said, fair enough. So they brought out this giant bowl of ice cream with probably five, six scoops of ice cream, and you know, all the sauces on top and everything. It wasn't my favorite ice cream that I, I, I just wanted straight chocolate, but you know, I was a purist, but I got the whole shebang. And, and, and uh, Jack's wife was just, you know, admonishing him saying, you know, you can't do it. He's gonna make him sick. And Jack's like, just be quiet, just be quiet. I wanna see this. Anyway, I finished the whole thing. It took me about a half hour, but I finished the whole thing. He said, well, I'll be damned. And so he gave me a dollar. It's probably, it was so painful for him to do that. Uh, one of the great achievements of my life. I once heard your dad speak, and they asked him about his wife and what was the best thing about her. Mm -hmm. And he said, if it hadn't been for her, we'd be in the slums because she was the best money manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mom, yeah mom, mom was a, a superstar uh, in, in so many ways. Um, number one, being married to somebody you know, uh, of dad's stature where everybody loves him. Everybody puts him up on a pedestal and everybody, you know, wants and needs his time. So she had to always stand back in the shadows and, you know, while she's, you know, staying home with the four kids, making sure we're all, get to where we go, and we're all fed and all that stuff and being there still to support him for everything that he needed. So she was amazing in that way of just dying to her own needs to be able to make sure that everybody else, you know, would have, you know, their part of Gordie Howe. And Dad recognized that. He he always said, you know, your job is way harder than my job. I just get to do this game that I love and talk with the fans, and you have to deal with everything else. So he recognized that he he adored, he absolutely adored her. 
and it, it was a nice uh, model for me and all our siblings growing up that, you know, I, Kelly and I actually were coming up on our 40th anniversary, uh, December 30th, and uh, that's in big part due to the, the loyalty that her mom and dad had as well as, you know, my mom and dad. And, and uh, um, so dad, he treated her like a queen in his entire life. He would open up doors for mom. I mean, you know, and if anybody ever said anything bad about Mrs. Hockey, Oh boy, you know, they would be, that was rare, but it happened on occasion. After she became uh, dad's agent and was, was making inroads as a business person, that was not really accepted for, for women at the time. And so she was, she was stepping on, you know, shoes. And, uh, and so whenever anything negative would be said, you know, he would have a discussion with them, you know, including yeah. Bruce Norris. So anyway, um, but uh, she was not only a great partner um, for him and a great business person, but she was also just a phenomenal mom. You know, again, she made sure we all knew that we were loved, and she just was, she was my number one fan, really, to the day she, she passed away. And uh, I think a big part of, of my own joy in life is not just from my dad, but, but from, from my mom. They just loved people, and they loved, they just, felt like every second on earth was just a, a, a gift and you should try to make the most of it. Uh, I've got a question about where you grew up. Surprise, surprise. Yes. After the war, as we all know, Detroit was bursting at the seams. Yeah, after the war, Detroit was bursting at the seams with almost two million people. So you had this incredible growth of the ring suburb. Now your folks could have chosen Birmingham or Royal Oak, which were much bigger communities, but you yeah. chose my hometown of Laker Village, which is only 1.5 square miles. Yes. And they not only liked it, but in the book and how photos and things feature after your dad passed, there are Laker pictures that I showed you today in the book. How did they choose Laker? You know, it's a good question. I wish I knew. I, I seem to recall some story of that there was somebody that lived there that said, oh, you've got to come check this area out. And I, but I don't know who that was. I only know that I'm really glad that they did because Lather Village was just an idyllic place to, to grow up. Very, very safe. Every neighbor knew every neighbor. And um, you know, you could ride your bike anywhere. I could ride to school and hike to school. And that, that was, just, it was, just, it was just fantastic. And you know, dad and mom were so open. Anybody could come to our door, knock on the door and say, can I have an autograph? Or can we just have a picture with you? Or whatever. And so they were always open to that. And dad was, of course, outside mowing the lawn or again, you know, mowing someone else's lawn. And um, so it was just this wonderful, you know, wonderful, uh, you know, environment. I, I feel bad now for professional athletes. And it's, this might sound funny, but it's, it, it's true to me that sometimes when you make so much money and you know you have so many things and so you live in these you know exclusive kind of neighborhoods where you can't get through the gates and this kind of thing so you're you're kind of isolated from each other so it, in Lathrop it was the opposite of isolation and uh, so I have so many fond memories every night we were playing kick the can or something and I'm sure you remember that as well it's just uh, you know there was constantly and we would eat at whoever whoever had the best dinner going you know we would eat at their house you know you would do a survey during the day and then you'd eat at their house so you know and I mean we just walk in people's homes you know like hey is Cole there you know or whatever I mean it was just it was a it was a different time but a very very special you know time for us and, very, very thankful we were able to grow up there. And there's one right over here. Thank you. Um, Courtney Howard wants to support uh, as a young athlete. Can you think of a time where a story that you related to early in his career where maybe you didn't have that support or you felt you could do it or uh, some defeat perhaps uh, with all the success? Is there anything in his early part of his career that you can recall or he passed on to you or shared with you that you know, he thought of through? Yeah, you know, he he would, whenever anybody said, wow, Gordy, you are so amazing, and you know, you're the best, and blah, 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 the first thing he would say is, I owe it all to my team, and my coach, and my family, and he would give credit to everybody except for himself. So he always felt that he had had that support. He always felt like the, uh, the wings had his back as well. I think he knew Jack Adams was never going to, he was never going to trade him. That said, 
he was he lived in mortal fear that he was not going to make the team even when even when he was the leading scorer in the league in the middle of his career he would be out there you know during the preseason tryouts warm-ups whatever you want to call it and he'd be crushing anybody who was a right winger that might take his position and Honestly, the other Redmond players did not want to be in the tryout with him if they were in the right wing position. They were afraid he would literally like damage them um, because you know once the season started, he was your best friend. Until then, you know he was a, you were a, a potential threat, and he was going to make sure that you knew that you were not going to be in the first line of the Red Wings right wing. Um, so anyway, so there so he but he did feel that support of the team. I think most of the players loved playing with him, but. For anyone who's at that kind of level, there's gonna be a few people who are jealous maybe of your position and uh, that's something difficult I think for somebody like Gretzky even, you know, or or you know, Ovechkin or whatever. If you get lots of playing time and the whole world is saying, Wow, you're so great or whatever, then you're like, well, what am I? I? I'm the second leading scorer, you know, on the team and no one even knows my name. So that's kind of a, that's a tough thing to, to go through. So there was always some of that that he had to deal with on, you know, on every team that he played with. And I think how he would get around that is, you know, he said, Murray, I'm much more excited by every goal that everybody else gets on the team besides me. So players would soon realize that the reason they were doing so well was a big part because of him, because he would set them up and he would show them little, you know, tips and tricks or, or, or whatever. So, um, you know, I think, I, think, I think he always felt support and he also, everybody else around him felt supported by him. And that's one reason they had so much success as a team is that it was never about him. It was just about the team. Now we'll go over to this side here. Hi, Murray. Howdy. My name's Joseph. And um, I have a comment and a question. Yes. Um, as a young kid, and as a man standing before you, I always gravitated to the playmakers. Uh, not only were they, I recognized their skill, but there's something about them that resonated with me in terms of their humility, mm -hmm. their generosity, their, their uh, ability to support others for the greater good. Yeah. And off the ice, I always, I always uh, recognized and appreciated players who did things for their communities um, and, and stood up to injustice and, uh, and uh, cared for the marginalized. And your dad was that. And for me, um, though today we, we're paying our props to Gordy Howell. For me, it was Alex Delvecchio mm -hmm. and Stanley Pia. Yeah. To my question, as a young Murray Howell, could you share any memories with me? Because I don't have any other opportunity to, but today to ask you. Sure. What are what if you have memories of those two gentlemen? Could you share that with us? Yeah, so Makita, I don't, just because he mostly was with Chicago when I was growing up, and so my dad would try to smash him into the boards as much as possible. Um, even though off the ice he thought he was a great guy, but I just remember him saying, did you see me get Makita tonight? <laughs> Whatever. Um, and so I, I remember Stan from that. And, uh, and Del Vecchio, you know, he was an incredible centerman, and he became the centerman, um, at, you know, after uh, Abel retired. And, uh, you know, dad worked really well with them, so my parents would hang out with them, and they would do, you know, uh, you know dinners together, and families were, were, were friends. And often we would go, after the season, we would go down to um, Florida, um, to Homosassa Springs, where the Redmond's owned, or the Norris's owned uh, a resort, and all the players would be together, and I would just hang out with uh, Alex Jr., who was about my age, and, um, I remember that vividly. I used to think, wow, that's so nice that Mr. Norris would pay for all this stuff for all these players. And then my mom said, he didn't pay for it. It was a lot of pressure to go down there. You didn't go down there, you were kind of in trouble. So anyway, but I'm still glad that they went down and paid their way. And, and uh, we had a, a Florida trip out of it. Um, but anyway, uh, Tobacco is very, very you know, kind family. And 
I think many of the many of the the, the, the team members on the Red Wings at that time, they kind of um, conspired in terms of what things they were going to do for the community. You know, working together and if Gordy Howe was doing it, you, you felt like you got to do something. You know, or whatever. So each player's kind of had their own you know kind of uh, pet projects that they wanted to be involved with and. I, you know, you, you, you look at that bridge out, out there and, you know, that bridge isn't built because Gordy Howe, you know, played more games than anybody or scored almost as many goals as anyone. It's because of the community things. It's because of everybody that met him loved him and he set such a great example for the community and for giving back. And that's kind of like, that's something that we can, you know, whether Canadian, American, or whatever, we can all be proud of that you know, of, of, of that, of, of that um, motto, that way of living. And I think people would, you know, say people in Detroit are, are givers. And that's, you know, I think that just, you know, that is continuing. Thank you. Sure. We are uh, starting to run short on time, so we'll just take a few more. Corey, thank you for coming out today. We're enjoying these stories. But it's funny, I also had a question about health. Right now, in a way. Um, Del Vecchio was the captain for 20 years while your dad was on the team. Yes. How did your dad feel about that? Yeah. Because as the leader, as you said, but yet he wasn't the captain. Yeah. He was a quiet leader. He didn't need any kind of recognition. I think he, he was a captain for one year. I think he felt uncomfortable in that role just because he didn't want to hog the spotlight, really. Um, I think he was a natural leader. He led by example. So he was carrying out the role that way. And also, the refs often just came over and talked to him like he was the captain, <laughs> because they, they all loved him and knew him. And they're like, Gordy, you know, what's going on here, or whatever, what do you think we should do here, or whatever. And so it was, and he had that, you know, that's why they hardly ever called penalties on him compared to what he should have had. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but so I think he felt, I think he, he was glad to give the accolades to other people, and, and Alex was a natural leader, and very level-headed, very gentlemanly, so he was a perfect, you know, he was a perfect uh, captain to take over. Yes? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, so the I was just gonna say that your dad has two bridges uh, named after him, one in Saskatoon as well, as well as the statue in uh, Saskatoon. My, my father's from a little town in Elfstone, just outside of Saskatoon, but he, he left when he was about 19, joined the RCMP, but he yes. had, had a lot of qual human qualities, like uh, the way you talk about your father, and uh, my, my father being, uh, older though, he was born in 1910. Yeah. But uh, thanks very much for your lecture. Oh yeah, my pleasure. And yes, so few people know that there's actually two Gordie Howe bridges, the one in Saskatoon that's already built, and the one that's almost connected uh, just across the way there. And so that's, uh, that bridge is supposed to be done, we're, we're understanding maybe around spring of 2015. So we're hoping that you can all join us for that. It's supposed to be a a, 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 a a bike path as well as walking path. So you should be able to go right over to Windsor and continue on to Saskatoon if you want to keep going. <laughs> uh, but uh, it should be just a wonderful thing and and certainly a great tribute to you know to to Dad, but also just a great connection between between the United States and, and Canada. Just just building those, those those bonds even further. So we're so excited for that. So thank you all for coming. That was really a lot of fun.